Hill on Monday, August 27, 2012 at 7 p.m. Madam Chairman, please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Here. Mr. Frazier. Here. Mr. Percassi. Here. Mr. Steiner. Here. Ms. Gordon. Here. Mr. Lance. Ms. Seymour. Here. You have a floor. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Will you please stand and join us in the Pledge of Thank you. 
damage by fire. Participation in this program provides yet another tool to protect the health, safety, and community appearance standards in the city. This program was reviewed at the August 13, 2012 study session. Under state law, this program goes into effect 30 days after passage of the resolution this evening. Item CAB is authorization to renew the communication equipment maintenance agreement with Motorola Inc. of Schaumburg, Illinois. Motorola is the manufacturer of our dispatch center communication network and related radio equipment. The recommended agreement is for the two-year period of October 1, 2012 through September 30, 2014 in the total two-year amount of $170,813. This represents an annualized increase of 1.5% over the 2010 contract price for the highly specialized services with response time guarantees. Funds are provided in the 2012-2013 fleet operations communications budget and will be requested in future budgets as company approved. Item C is approval of the bid award for office supplies and other business related products with staples ink to be provided from the Southfield Distribution Center for the two year term August 28, 2012 through August 27, 2014 at an estimated annual cost of $44,000. This represents a 4.3% reduction over the previous annual round of $46,000. Funds are provided for this purpose in the 2012 2013 approved office supply accounts and will be requested in future budgets as council may approve. Item D is a board of bids to HT, H2, H2O Utility Services of Burton, Michigan in the not to exceed amount of $81,725 for installation of new replacement commercial meters for approximately 715 commercial accounts. The recommended company has successfully completed similar projects for other Michigan municipalities. Funds are provided for this purpose in the 2012-2013 water and sewer budget. Item E is approval of a fireworks display requested by Lawrence Technological University in conjunction with the university's 80th anniversary and the inauguration of the seventh president on September 27, 2012. Item F is approval of a self-release assistance recommended board of directors appointment which requires a joint approval of the city, the Southfield Public Schools, and the Oakland County Circuit Court. The purpose of self-release assistance in the private Michigan nonprofit corporation is to strengthen families by reducing kids' sense of delinquency and neglect through positive community involvement. Madam President. Mr. President. I move that we approve consent agenda items A, B, C, D, E, and F. Support. Motion by Mr. Frazier, supported by Ms. Jordan, to approve consent agenda items C, A, A, to C, A, F. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion has carried. Thank you. May I have a motion? Mr. Frazier. I have one question and this has to do with consent agenda items F, F, and D, and the Southfield Youth Assistance Board. What sort of relationship do we have, I guess the rest of the chair to the attorney, in terms of their reporting back to us, or us exactly knowing the council, knowing what their, what's happening with them and their operation? Well, Mr. Chair, as you're aware, this used to be the old PYG commission. And it developed and actually was transformed then into this private nonprofit corporation. It follows the models now of various other cities where the Oakland County Circuit Court provides the funding for the social worker who runs the program in that area. But the way this was structured, because there is city involvement in terms of, we do, we still do a lot of the campership programs through block grant program funding. The schools provide space for them, so it's a joint effort. The articles of incorporation don't specifically say that they have a reporting obligation, but I think that certainly as kind of one of the partners of the three entities, I'm sure that if we convey to the organization that we would like some type of indication of the activities that they've been involved in, I'm sure they'd be more than willing to cooperate, because they like the strength of the three partners working together. So I think that that's a good thing. Thank you. 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 Thank you
So I'm sure that uh, you know they have a social worker who, who is funded by the county. That person could probably come on, a, on some kind of re regular basis and report as to what their activities are.
ones that I know uh, for certain had considerable experience uh, working when this was a city commission. Some, but mainly the funding is through the to the city through Black Grant and Parks and Recreation programs. Well, the funding comes from the Black Grant. Yes.
impact of CBS Radio coming into the city of Southfield is great. We'll be retaining their headquarters in the community. In addition to the 151 people that are employed at CBS Radio in Southfield, they'll be relocating 163 um, employees into that vacant building. Um, again, the owner is making a $3 million investment, and CBS Radio is very active and works with uh, many of our Southfield businesses on a regular basis. So we see this as a big win-win. Again, it's strengthening our partnership and our local business community. Um, it's helping um, for us to compete against our neighboring businesses. There was a chance that CBS Radio could relocate all of their facilities at one of their other locations. Um, we'll be bringing in 164 um, jobs into the community. We'll help continue to keep our business community diversified by having more um, radio stations and that type of um, business in our community. And again, we'll still be collecting the real property. And we know that as CBS Radio continues to evolve, they, they hope to grow stronger in the market and they have pledged to work with our career center to fill any vacant positions. One of the other big areas that uh, was in contention at the um, July 16th meeting, um, the property owner did have a, an appeal on their taxes. That appeal has been dropped. So, um, you know, we we'll, we'll hope that that issue has been removed from the table. So um, I'd like to uh, turn the floodlights back on so that um, the people in the viewing audience are not impeded by the presentation. And
like to speak in general about these policies that have continued for so long. And oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to interrupt you. I need your address. Pardon? I, I need your address for the record. You have it in my back up. I put it. Well, I have it. It, it. We always give the name and address. You can give it to the clerk if you wish. Yes, it's already in the record. I already gave it when I signed up for this I general public comment. I'm staying with someone else. I don't know if they want their Go address ahead. published. Go ahead. Um, in general, over time, for example, Southfield um, was announced to be a farming community at one time. I have been here since the beginning of June. I don't see any farms left in the city. And even though in the short term such enterprises as being proposed will get some jobs, these jobs are contingent on a private commercial jurisdiction that our country has been put under, and we are losing control of those necessities of life that will sustain us if there is such a thing, and there will be, I believe, an economic collapse, um, political and social collapse, I believe, are imminent in this country. We are being deceived because under this private commercial jurisdiction, all the avenues of information are controlled by the same people who now control our economy. We're not under the principles of the Republic. When we pledge allegiance to this flag, it's not true that that flag stands for the Republic. It stands for the central commercial government in Washington, D.C., which is owned, if we track it, by the owners of the three banks of cartels that are headquartered in Washington, D.C., the Federal Reserve, the IMS, and the World Bank. Unless we break the hold that those people have on this country, we will not ensure that freedom sustains here. The Control of our information, our curriculums, and our schools, uh, the, the press and the media. Ms. Amato, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're to speak to the issue of. Uh, well, the issue is there. that we're going to create jobs by having a corporation set in place with certain tax abatements, which is the policies of the municipal corporations over time because of who controls them. But the people at the local level do not control the policies of these institutions. We must break the hold of the commercial private jurisdiction that has this nation in a stranglehold. We are being set up, not only the people who work for CBS Radio or the corporations, all these corporations, and including the public corporations, are owned by the same people, namely those who own those three banks to cartels. So unless we are willing to take the lead ourselves, and set a course here to get the ship of state off this treacherous course, we will inherit disaster. We have no way of sustaining ourselves here if the economy collapses because we have forfeited control of our food supply, our fuel supply, our transportation mode. We're dependent totally on those who control the wealth of this nation by intrigue, fraud, treason. There must be enough people that are willing to have the courage to step forward. You have a plaque outside that says, in valor, there is hope. There's not enough brave people today to speak out and to do something other than what the master is dictating. There must be, if we are to survive as a free people. We must talk the truth and we must turn off the lies and begin talking to each other directly instead of mouthing what we're told all the time. We are not thinking for ourselves. And I just pray to God that the people under the counsel of the Holy Spirit will take some leadership in this country because it is the only spirit of truth in this earth, the Holy Spirit of the one true living God. But there's a multitude of liars deceiving us. So the corporate enterprises uh, will engage in such activities that are sanctioned by the rules that come down from the federal central government, but it will not sustain us as we need to be sustained because we have a group of people in control of this nation to plan to do us in and they're setting us up step by step or letting them do it without any resistance. Any questions? Thank you. Is this the public hearing? Anyone that wishes to come and please step forward? Please combine the remarks to the subject of this particular public hearing. Fred Boker, 24201 Garner Street. I've been living
living in somewhat of an elation in the past few weeks as Mr. Fercasi on television had announced that there were no more tax abatements in Southfield. Did you ever make that statement, Mr. Fercasi, that the tax abatement policy overburdened with Caucasian approval had come to its last days? We can't continue with one racial group benefiting from this policy year after year. And with no disrespect, CBS is quite wealthy. And if there was no claim that a tax abatement policy doesn't exist, I'd like to read from the guidelines of that tax abatement policy that you agree exists in writing in the city of Southfield, Mr. Fercasi, for the official record through the chair. The tax abatement policy in its existence with guidelines pertinent to tax abatement approval. Mr. Broker? Yes. Yes, there is a policy on tax abatement. Great. Then we agree and I'm disappointed again that it continues. Could we stop my clock if he's going to speak? Well, you asked me. You said I said so. I asked you yes or no. I didn't ask you to elaborate. Okay. The guidelines, Mr. Moss, maybe you've never seen a copy of the tax abatement policy. Have you? For the official record through the chair? Yes? No? Have you ever seen a copy of the tax abatement policy? This is getting into a dialogue and we can talk about that when it's a complicated problem. Mr. Broker, this is not a dialogue. Okay. I'm talking about a tax abatement policy that's under consideration. I have the guidelines to be considered prior. I'm telling you that you're not going to have a dialogue. This is not a chance for counsel for you to have dialogue. No, they cannot answer you. Say what you want to say. They're not going to answer you. That is not the way we conduct this. Criteria? Just answer your comments. You've got a yes answer. Either do it as I suggest or you're going to have to sit down. No, now I'm completely acknowledging I understand the situation. You can comment. You can comment. You cannot have a dialogue with counsel. They're not going to answer you. I'm done with that. Could you start my clock over? No, you can pick up. I'll give you the extra time. Go ahead. Criteria used in reviewing applications, guidelines for tax abatement, subheading 6 under the 1974 PA19 Act, compliance with the Southfield Zoning Ordinance and Master Plan. There must no outstanding taxes owed by the applicant. Submission of site plans and elevations. The project is a redevelopment or rehabilitation project or a new development that is vital to the future of the city. Vital. Additional permanent jobs will be created as a result of the project. The project, there is a demonstrated need for financial assistance. Has this gentleman, Ms. Freeman, may I ask Ms. Freeman a question? No, no, absolutely not. Does the demonstrated need for financial assistance be established with CBS Radio? Yes or no? Yes. Say this, they've shown a need for financial aid. Yes, yes. Mr. Bunker. I meant that yet. The project, the applicant has an affirmative action program. Has that been attested to? This is not a dialogue, Mr. Bunker. Sorry, you can't ask questions. The new investment will promote community health, safety, and welfare. To determine the number of years for which a project may be eligible, the city council will utilize the tax exemption charge, which is a matrix of new jobs created and dollar value of new investment. Is the spokesman for the city, the representative of the tax abatement recipient here tonight, determined that on a yearly basis, the actual number of jobs created will be taken into account by the assessor's office as included in the tax abatement policy directions? This is not a question and answer period. I'm saying things out loud for people at home to wonder about. Fine, go ahead. Because Bliss City approves tax abatements for decades with one race in mind, a very narrow race considering the population of Southfield in 1974 might have been a majority of the type of, the same racial background as the applicants and or the publicly traded CBS, if it is a publicly traded corporation, shouldn't be asking us to sacrifice our personal tax revenue to pay 
pay their bills. This happened next door to me with Maxitrol. This city agreed that this city would pay the white non-resident owned Maxitrol company to install a fence and pay all expenses while Mr. Crow acknowledged that nothing illegal was taking place. While dozens of trees were cut down, we'll, get, we'll address that in a little while. I don't approve of tax abatements. If these people want the prestige of a Southfield address, let them pay their fair share of taxes like the rest of us. I'm ashamed that a company like CPS would appear here after having watched the, some of the comings and goings of that corporation. And they're here entirely to make money off the residents. They don't need this financial assistance. That's the definition of a tax abatement. It's a tax application for financial. Your time is up. I've given you extra time. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Never anything personal. It's a process in the city. I disagree with you. So if anyone else wishes to address the council on this specific, specific issue, please step forward. Otherwise, I declare the public hearing closed. Council? Madam Chair? Yes. Yes. Public hearing eight. So staff note, the establishment of an industrial development district is what's on the table right now. Madam Chair? Ms. Jordan. I'd like to make a recommendation that we approve the recommended resolution to establish the district for the public hearing. Scored. I have a motion by Ms. Jordan, supported by Mr. Fraser, that we establish the industrial development district under public act 198 for CBS. Yes, before we vote, Mr. Lance. Go ahead. Go ahead. First, I'd like to congratulate Fred Bunker for the research he did. I didn't know some of that. Or most of that. Thank you. Okay. As you know, I oppose tax abatements, too. And I am surprised that CBS, who is probably a trillion-dollar corporation coming to our South Hill, they must have ten times the money we have. And we're struggling now with the home closures and many other problems. No tax. Not enough taxes are coming in to support our police, our fire, our cities. And we get no help from the corporations. Most of the help goes to Detroit, not us. We're nothing. So we cannot afford to give away, to allow people to come in and not pay their taxes. If it's for three years, five years, to you it's, to me it's peanuts that you want. But those peanuts sustain us, help sustain us. I'll never understand why all the big corporations come to us for tax abatements. They can afford to give us money, to give us a tax abatement from you. Now, you have six stations here. They're all making money, aren't they? Otherwise, you wouldn't be in business. We're not making money. Everything we get is paid out just to exist. We're down 250 people. I think we're down X amount of five police. We just can't afford not to take in any taxes. You come along and you want the taxes. I have a question. Does the property owner get a tax abatement too? Where they're moving into? They're not buying the property, they're renting it. That's correct. Does the developer get a tax break too? Actually, the real property taxes are passed on to CBS Radio. So CBS Radio will be actually paying the real property taxes as a condition of their lease. And the property owner is not getting a tax abatement. Who is he not to pay taxes? Do the homeowners pay taxes? Yes. He's a property owner. Why shouldn't he pay taxes? He is paying the taxes. All right. Why should he have to benefit also? 
Give us a dividend of the money you made during that period. Good idea. Take it back to your board. See if the board will grant us a dividend. The city, not the individual. Anyway, just a second. Thank you. She's impatient. No, I didn't. You say her name. I'm trying to say. You, you talk about the jobs. Of course, they'll hire some people. One, two. They don't hire a hundred people. Every corporation that came in here said they would hire 400 people, 300 people, 1,000 people. And the end result is that they hire two, three, or four. That's a lot. And we have no way of oversight. We don't have any oversight over these people who have tax abatements. I've been around a long time, and I see what, what's happening in the economy and everything. Nothing's happening to them. They, they have trillions of dollars in cash in their, in their, I don't know where they keep it, but someplace. Overseas, maybe. And of course, I'm not going to go to, you know, I don't go to the tax abatements. And they should be ashamed to come to us and asking us for the money. I don't even know how much they're getting. How much, how much are they getting? From the city, $73,000. Mm -hmm. In five, three years? Over five years. Five years. Five years. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. All right, I think I'll stop, but I'll vote no. And you should go back and tell your board that one councilman, <coughs> one councilman is asking them not to take, a, not to come for a tax abatement, but to uh, give us a dividend. Why well, could have come into Southfield? We we deserve it. We give you fire protection, police protection, uh, everything. We protect you. Pay us for that. In those five years. After that, I know you're going to pay taxes. How much more can I say? Will I move anybody here? No. You're going to get it. Yes. Well, I'll finish now, shall I? Thank you. All right, the recommendation is uh, for the um, establishment of an industrial development district, motion by Mr. By Ms. Jordan, supported by Ms. Uh, uh, Mr. Frazier. All in favor? Hold on. I have no way of saying that also. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Um, to Ms. Freeman, uh, what is the state involvement in this? Um, there is no state involvement in this project. Okay. And um, <coughs> uh, when uh, Mr. Ross was left for us, uh, I was not going to support this uh, tax abatement because of the property tax appeal of the owner of the property. And um, I'm pleased to learn yesterday that the owner of the property has dropped his tax um, appeal. Um, and basically what we're talking about here is about $74,000 in new taxes that the city is waiving for a return of $477,105. Um, I would be foolish to vote uh, no on this. Um, this is, um, I, I don't know why, uh, every time we have a tax payment, we go through the same thing. Um, whether you believe the, the job parts, although they're audited, it's about reinvesting in empty buildings in Southfield, and you waive a little bit of taxes uh, on new investments um, to get a big return um, after the, the three to five year period is up. Uh, and yet, we continually have people who get up and say the same thing over and over again about tax abatements, and uh, the math, it, uh, I don't agree with their math. Um, the the, the uh, 10-year projection that was on the PowerPoint as well as what's in our packet, I think, explains uh, this very clearly. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Seidman. Mr. Hoffman? Yes, so that we tie up some loose ends, Madam Chair. Uh, 
some time ago, there was a, a uh, policy on tax abatement. It was quite some time ago. This is not an ordinance. This is a policy. And policies can be reviewed and taken one at a time, depending on the issue before us. The power uh, as the employees, that there's an audit to ensure that, that the individuals do hire that many people. We do the audit, and, um, and if not so, they do not get the abatement. Um, Panasonic was in that building at one time, and they were, uh, they went to Farmington Hills with abatement. So this is being played out in, in all cities, and, and uh, we have to compete. We're the ones that have 30 million square feet of office space. That is our base, base that we get our revenue from. And anything that reduces those 30 million square feet to vacancies contribute to appeals to be reduced in value. So to keep them filled is an advantage to the city and to our residents that live here and get their services from us. So uh, I just wanted to explain that. And, and the final thing I want to say is, is that I have never said that I was against tax abatement. I take each case each case by its own merits. If there's no merit, I will not be approving it. Thank you, Mr. Picasso. I think one important factor to remember is that we're competing against uh, neighboring cities for business, and the fact that we can have this tool available to us to offer a tax abatement that will keep them here. And in five years, the taxes that we pay will begin to come back even on a greater scale than we did before. I clearly understand and respect Councilman Lance's position. I, I we can't argue with him. This is what he believes, but I think each of us have to look at. In fact, I look at each one of these individually, but I do believe in this case it's best for the city of Southfield, and I'm glad that they're consolidating. by CBS. CBS um, has not made a substantial investment in some time and they're making a, a when they met with their New York um, office, they made a decision to make this consolidation and square do you want to talk about that? And this tax abatement was integral to their decision. Can we wait until we've had the comments from council and we'll have to see All right, Ms. Uh, Mr. Lance, you're not anyone else? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I just uh, want to briefly chime in on this, um, spe uh, specifically talk to Mr. Bunker. And the reason I say, you know, it's not a dialogue, I think it's the perfect opportunity for you to take the opportunity um, to address the council and express your thoughts. And, I, you know, there's merit to it, and there's merit to what Mr. Land said. Um, and I'll be honest, the information that you uh, gave to the council, and, and I didn't want to say it at the time to kind of interrupt the flow of your, uh, of your message, it, it was new to me like it was to Mr. Land. But the way that I kind of do my, my research and, and come to a, uh, a conclusion of how I'm going to vote is that I, I, talked, I talked to Ms. Freeman, I talked to our administrator on everything that kind of in, in this packet in particular um, to uh, the things that come before us. And one thing that really, uh, in this uh, particular case, is that there is a, a hub in Ferndale, if I'm not mistaken, and a hub in Farmington Hills that's going to be consolidated into, into South Hills, is that correct? Okay, that, now that, that's meaningful to me in particular because that is consolidating uh, branches of this corporation, putting them within the city of Southfield to bring jobs to our city. And as everybody knows, you know, we have this struggle where we have this daytime population in Southfield and we have this nighttime population in Southfield. And I've said it before, the struggle for us as a city is going to be merging those two together because there's a vast disparity. A lot of people who work here, and we have a less amount of people who, who actually live here. And if the opportunity is to bring someone into Southfield on a day-to-day -day basis to shop here, to eat here, um, maybe stay after work and grab dinner, I think that's important to bringing people into knowing what Southfield is, and as they continue to transition in life, uh, perhaps want to one day be a homeowner in Southfield. 
that is something that's important to me, especially if someone in my generation, uh, where you have a lot of people who work in Southwood but do not live in Southwood. And as we try and grow our population base, this is a way to introduce people to the city of Southfield. Uh, and we're bringing workers from this region to the city of Southfield. So that's why uh, I see it, it is a vital economic need uh, for us as a city. Um, and, and it was mentioned before, uh, we, we, sh we are used to be a city that's proud for what we're known for, I think is what was mentioned. We should be continuing to be proud that we are the communication hub uh, of this region. We have Channel 7, ABC, Channel 2, Fox. I think we have Mind TV and we have CBS, the television station. I'd love to continue to have that and bring CBS radio uh, here to the city of South Hills. So that's why I'm supportive of this. The, the other option is a vacant office space that, that it, it just sits dormant. Um, so to breathe a little life into this city, I'm supporting this uh, project moving forward. Anyone else? Okay, I want to say something. Um, we have been, and presumably still are, the business center of Southeast Michigan. We have more businesses here than probably close to 10 cities larger than ourselves in a three-state area. I want to see businesses continue to be here. And when you have a company like CVS consolidate and have, take a prominent place, it attracts other businesses. Businesses want to come where successful businesses are. And other companies will be attracted to come here when they see the likes of Lear Corporation, uh, CVS, Eaton Corporation. That attracts people to want to come here. These important companies are here. Other companies say, maybe we should take a look at Southfield. And in order for us to continue to maintain that prominence that we have as the business center of Southeast Michigan, we can't turn away people in, that want to take a building that's vacant in a prominent location in a city. I'm totally in support of this. I think it's so short-sighted. You know, when these things come this far to council, if it was wrong, it wouldn't reach this point. We have key staff, well-trained professional staff that look at these things. It goes through many, many sessions to reach this point. It's very short-sighted to think that this is something bad. We're in a competitive market. We have this going on everywhere. They've chosen to come here. I'm delighted that CBS wants to consolidate, Mr. Ross, and I want Mr. Ross, I want you to know that. Um, they're my favorite station anyway. But I'm, I'm delighted, and as, as uh, Mr. Moss said, we have ABC, we have Fox, we have, uh, we have several major stations here, major media, TV and radio stations here. We should be proud of this. And to ask for this little bit of help, it's something everyone's able to offer. It's a minor thing to bring more employees here. I'm happy to, and proud to say that I support this. And I make no apology for it. I'm proud to see you. I'm delighted that you want to come in. I'm delighted that the Panasonic building will be um, uh, built. I'm <coughs> sorry that Panasonic made the lose Panasonic. And I agree with Mr. Seiber. When we had this appeal removed from the owner of the property, that's something we don't do. We don't let them do both. And thank goodness they did uh, remove their appeal. So that made it open the doors for this to happen. With that, Mr. Lance, do you want to say something that we call for vote? I must say something now. <laughs> this city is 50 years old, right? We're here 50 years. Tell me, if anybody knows the answer, when these tax basements started in the city of Southfield? 1974. Okay. okay. <laughs> Before 1974, we gave no tax abatements. Corporations came here, they wanted to come here. All of a sudden, the new corporations, maybe they got smart or somebody told them, the city of Southfield will give you money to move here. Okay? And if they didn't say that, you'd move here anyway. So you're taking our money since 1974. And from the year 2004 to 2010, we gave away the people of this city <coughs> gave away $24 million. I don't have the figures after 2010. But up to then, it's $24 million we gave away in taxes. That's why we had to ask for a million. We have to struggle and everything. Why? Well, I can understand why the corporations do that. Every single dollar counts. I worked for corporations. I had a few of them. 
I needed every dollar too, although I didn't need it, I took it. I'm one of you, no more. <laughs> I changed. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, I'm all in one. Good luck to you. And uh, I'll still be here for a while, and I'll see you maybe benefit the city. I'd like to know, anyone can answer, how do the people directly benefit? Don't tell me they'll go to restaurants or, or, or night clubs or something like that. How can they benefit to save the homes, uh, not have their cars uh, repossessed, or the suffering that's, that's going on in jobs? In this uh, career they mentioned, it's only recently they started to tell the corporations to, to get the help here. Come on, if you check the records of our career employment, you'll see very few jobs being given out. Because the corporations don't come to us to hire people from here. From here. Anyway, it's no use talking anymore. I say no. Mr. Frazier? Yeah. <coughs> I've heard a lot of people say a lot of different things. And uh, the very pragmatic thing about this what we're doing right now is the building is empty because another city gave a tax abatement to the current, to the past resident of that building business to move away from Southview, which opened the door for CBS to come back in and fill it up and bring money back in. So we lost money because the the, the past uh, lease lessee moved away and now we're trying to fill it back up and bring money back in. So if we didn't if we didn't work a deal to entice CBS to come to Southfield, we would have lost the money with no way to recoup any of the money that we lost. So that's why I'm supporting it. Thank you, Mr. President. This is the establishment of an industrial development district. I want to I want to say one thing. Mr. Lance and others have said, how do the citizens benefit from this? The commercial, the business district of our business side of our city pays 60% of the property taxes, that it, of the taxes that it takes to run the city. 60%. That's how the residents benefit. They pay less than they would pay if this was an entirely residential community and we had to provide the same services. So it is a benefit to the residents. Anyway, we have a motion on the table. I think everyone's spoken um, by Ms. Jordan, supported by Mr. Frazier, to establish an industrial development district for CBS, CBS um, pardon me? CBS Radio. CBS Radio, so thank you. Uh, I knew it wasn't TV, but that's all right. <laughs> I thought there was another part of the name. All right, all in favor? All right. Opposed? Motion has carried. Uh, next. Yes, I know you did. But it's carried. Okay. It's to one. It's, at this time, we would like to request um, to open a public hearing to uh, for the personal property, place the personal property in the district that was just established. All right. For so a five-year time frame. Right, for a five-year time frame. All right, I'm going to declare the public hearing open. Anyone wishing to address the personal property exemption, which has already been addressed? Pamela Gero, P.O. Box 155, Southfield, Michigan, 48037-0155. My telephone number is 248-352-9188. Couple of things came up. The owner of the property had a tax appeal. I'm sure this tax appeal had been an ongoing situation for maybe a year or so. All of a sudden, they dropped the appeal. <coughs> Was there some kind of backdoor deal? Was there some kind of consideration? What would make a property owner be caught up in an appeal and then all of a sudden drop because they're going to get a new tenant? That's just one point. 60% of the Southfield tax base is businesses. <coughs> when you needed the millage, why didn't just the businesses have to pay for the millage? Why did you go to the residents? 
it seems like you say residents are so insignificant when you glorify the fact that businesses are 60% of the tax base, but you marketed the millage to the residents. So the residents are, in my opinion, more important than the businesses because this was, as Geraldine said, a farm town. And businesses wanted to come here. And they came for a reason. We're the center of it all. I want to know if CBS going to put a cafeteria in their building. Because if they have a cafeteria in the building, let's just say hypothetically they hire 164 people. They'll be eating inside of the building, not utilizing and giving the businesses to the restaurants in the area. And we've had some restaurants either close, we've had restaurants lay off employees, and we've had restaurants cut back on hours. So all of these abated employees that came with these companies, they're not eating out a whole lot. That's just something that I wanted to say. Now, we talk about, oh, this is not a whole lot of money. We couldn't even afford to have the fireworks. The fireworks was $88,000, $31,000 actually for the fireworks, and the rest was public safety. What a shame. Businesses go where they can get the best deal for the square footage when they're going to pay rent. I'm just wondering, does New York, Scottsdale, Arizona, West Palm Beach, and Malibu get tax abatement? Just the thought. And did the city work out some kind of deal where giving this tax abatement will be getting some free advertising with CBS? I know they're making a lot of money. All you got to do is look at how much they charge for political ads. The price quadruples. <coughs> Businesses like to move because they like to show their financial trend. And what they're doing, their tax abatement hopping. You come here, you get it for five years. They don't give it to you for another five years, then you go to the next municipality. And they'll keep doing that and doing that, and they'll never pay personal property taxes. Consider that. Anyone else wishing to address this issue? Please step yeah. forward. Uh, next Regarding the dis discussion on this issue, uh, we've made mention uh, about the big media outfits that make their home here in Southfield. The mass communications media it used to be called, informational and communications media. Today, every corporation, including all the media outfits, are owned by the same people. So the manipulations, distractions, corruptions, diversions, media, they do not inform us. We do not communicate with each other through that, those mediums. We have lost connection with one another. We don't own anything today in the continental United States. It is owned by the same people who own everything we have. We are in possession of some things, and we could choose to use those resources in possession to set a different course than other what the master has set for us, but we choose to continue to do the will of and bidding of our master in order to maintain our jobs. That can only go so far because when push comes to shove, <coughs> the masterminds and the overlords, with no respecter of persons, will take whatever they want from us and we will find that what we thought we had never belonged to us. Many people are finding that out already. People say the housing markets are a downturn. No homeowner owns their home. They're only allowed to have the illusion of ownership. Mortgage is rent. Before property taxes on your residence, people did not pay taxes on their domicile. Because we have moved into this private commercial jurisdiction, we pay taxes on everything. We get a license to do everything. Free people, free agents make contracts with one another without the state giving us a license to do so. There's nothing we can do to, today together with each other without getting a sanction from the central government and its representatives at the lower level. We are not in control. The people of 
sitting in this room and not in control of the government represented by this municipal corporation. And unless the good people of this nation have the will to reclaim control over the resources of this nation, including the political authority and the ability to communicate with one another through the mediums that are available, rather than everything being co-opted and censored. We don't have out and out, we just say, censorship in this nation, but we definitely have a filtering of information. We still get some information, but it's very carefully put a spin on it that's establishment approved. The conclusions that we need to draw are never publicized to us. That's why we don't even know how to talk to one another without mouthing what we heard somewhere else by the masters to their control of every medium of information, including our school curriculums, we've gotten our college degrees and so forth, and much of it is an organized system of lies that we get a degree in. And we're not questioning what is happening in this nation today. I hope that there are enough people left in this nation that are willing to take a stand and to realize that we're being used. <coughs> we're being manipulated, we have our junk and our stuff, and we want to maintain it, but we don't have each other. We don't know how to connect with one another. We don't know how to do anything with each other, except the master directs us how to do it. It's time for people to assert their liberty. Liberty is not something that's given by dictators, and we're moving towards a totalitarian regime in this country. The wealth has already been seized, and the minds of the next generation are being manipulated through all the new electronic gadgets that are being introduced that weren't available in my, in my time when I grew up. It's very difficult for a person coming up today to have any thoughts of their own because of who is in control. Now, if these people were benevolent, it might be okay to slide along with this program, but they are not benevolent. They have proven to be malevolent, and they plan to do it then if we continue to let them and we continue to go along with their projects and their programs. And this all represents that. This is part of, I mean, these nice people that are with CBS, they're a mercenary employees just like all of us in this room. Whatever we're doing, we're under their control, the people that control the wealth of this nation. We're not even on a lawful money system. We, we talk about money. This is fiat money. It has no value. And it loses its purchasing power with inflation and deflation, as we well know. Homeowners. We see what's happening with the, with the market. Some people think it's going to get better. It's not going to go back to what it was, just like the price of gasoline. It's not going to go back to dollar ten cents a gallon. It'll go up. It'll come back a little. Oh, gasoline's going down. But it's not going to go all the way back down. The same with the housing market. We're never going to see that housing market that existed in the 1950s. Mr. Miles, your time is up. Your time is okay. up. Okay. Thank you very much for putting up with me. <laughs> public hearing opportunity is for you to comment on the, map, the item at hand and people are making speeches. Mr. Bunker, <laughs> got his ears plugged, he doesn't want to hear this. <laughs> Come keep it. Mr. Bunker, please address the issue. This is an opportunity to address the issue. In lieu of Mr. Seibert's comments that we hear the same thing over and over, I'd like to bring some new information alerting <coughs> the council as regards Mr. Lance's statement of $24 million. Mr. Lance Lear got two tax abatements in 03 um, Wait, 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 wait. You're gonna, I've got to put, put you on the clock. You're going to start now. You've already given They were awarded $35 million in two tax abatements. Two years later, like the company that bought residential property next door to me, this council voted to allow Lear to buy residential property, a precedent Jack Ferris set in 2005 when Lear bought 100 acres. They turned around a year later and got a $13 million brownfield tax grant. That's $48 million, Mr. Lance, for Lear alone. The champion, six-time tax abatement award-winning that Mr. Charette in his depth investigation and tracking of tax abatements since January of 2010, just after Nick Banda resigned, just before the mayor was re-elected, Lear announced bankruptcy, mm -hmm. providing us all in the United States of America with a $400 million debt. 
That's what a tax abatement can turn into, Mr. Seiler, something you've never heard before. But since you were a supporting role in approving tax breaks like Mr. Moss as a junior councilman, what can be said to you? Nothing. Ignorance is bliss. For the permanent record, justice and liberty are hand in hand. The justice in this city would be made more right if these tax abatements were turned into tax endowments. This company could donate 50% of their taxes to our library, to our schools, and file for a federal tax credit. Solution. You don't have to give them my tax dollars. You don't have to cut me short. You don't have to legally cut trees down next door to me on residential property that wasn't voted to be approved for purchase by Max Patrol, your latest white-only, non-resident-owned company. The tax abatement list is filled with white people being approved for tax abatements. Mr. Charette can verify that. It's been two and a half years before he's publishing this tracking of tax abatements. I'm hoping we can expect that report the city administrator acknowledged he would create after the proverbial horse was out of the barn. He didn't track tax abatements before they went bankrupt. Otherwise, we would have known when they were $100 million, $200 million. We would have known that. Are you going to turn over a yearly expense report to see if they've demonstrated a need for financial assistance? That's the cornerstone of a tax abatement request, is that the applicant show an unequivocal need, a demonstrated need in the eyes of the assessor. Somebody who's not even part of any of this is supposed to determine if and or whether this company has shown a demonstrated need to receive a tax abatement. Another word for financial aid. Isn't that correct, city attorney? The tax abatement policy application for financial aid, yes or no? I'm sorry, I can't get a straight answer from the legal department in the city of Southfield. Is there anyone else that wishes to comment on this issue? Hearing none, I declare the public hearing closed. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the application for the personal property tax exemption under public act 328 for CCB tax radio. Support. Motion by Ms. Jordan, supported by Mr. Frazier. All in favor, signify by saying yes, aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Lance is voting no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to the city. Yes, Mr. Ross, thank you very much for sitting here. Be a good neighbor. Yeah, very good neighbor. Thank you. What about the property they abandoned to move into this property? Hmm. Never thought about that. Yes. We have no site plans this evening. Next we come to the communication portion of the agenda. And the first person requesting, the first person on our list is Mr. Fred Hunker. Hmm. Are you going to address for the record? Frederick Hunker, 24201 Garner. I'm disappointed Mr. Crowe isn't here tonight. He had some comments at the previous meeting I attended claiming that this Maxitrol, the white non-resident tax abatement beneficiary of a 2010 courtesy of Ms. Freeman, claimed that they were going to develop property on the east side of Telegraph. She never mentioned the fact that they were interested in buying property on the west side of Telegraph and never was I told that as a tax abatement recipient they could buy residential property as you've all taken part in the vote with Lear. Why did you vote to let Lear buy residential property and not vote? Ms. Warren, have you talked to Jim Moss? Have you talked to Mr. Crowe? Have you talked to Mr. Hunker? Have you talked to Mr. Crowe? Have you talked to Mr. Hunker? Have you talked to Mr.
or later bought residential property. Mr. And they got a brown tail tax break <laughs> six, three years before they declared a $400 million bankruptcy. Then we had a loss of a lot of employees. Mr. Banda, after being employed since July, Mr. Freed, for Kasi, is that correct, of 1980? Was Nick Banda hired? This is not a I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> I'm not in a, this is a family community. Don't talk to the members of your family, I remember the, the law. The city requires residents or their contractors to obtain a permit prior to removing any trees with a trunk eight, in, eight inches in diameter. Listen to this, at breast height. This is what they've added in this, uh, in your, uh, something Mr. Crow must not have looked at. It's called the residence plan. You ever seen one of these in the lobby? You couldn't read, apparently. Or larger on public or private property. Permits are issued at no charge. The planning department under the city's woodland and tree preservation ordinance. Any tree eight inches in diameter or larger must undergo an inspection prior to removal. Inspections and permits are required for all trees. All trees, regardless of site, size within a woodland area, like my backyard and the former backyard of my neighbor, a woodland area where no, no investigation, you should see the site. Somebody drive by there and take a look at what they left behind when they put an eight foot tall chain link fence that I've already elaborated on the one animal that's been killed or suffered to death, hung up by this illegal fence, claimed to be legal by some guy we hired here to do what he was told. Mr. Crone is not uh, as well educated as, he, as we may presume, and like I say, the baggage that came with him from the previous city planner and promises and appraisals ordered by the city attorney's office on my property have yet to be explained. <laughs> Mick Dan pulled like a, he pulled a cobra sometime, Mr. Cyber. Remember when he promised you what a great idea it would be to get cobras in it, $3 million tax break? <laughs> How long were they in business? Longer than Mr. Lance told you that night? Two years? Were they in business longer than two years? And was the only job created by Colbison for Kwame Kilpatrick? That's the only employee. You're confused, I know. At your age, you have a well-deserved ability to be confused. But Kwame Kilpatrick was employed by Colbison after Matt, after Microsoft bought them out in 15 months, Lance. You were wrong. It wasn't two years. They're out of business in 15 months. The tax abatement crap that Charette released indicates their tax abatement didn't expire for three years. They were gone out of that building. I drove by it every week. They had two employees there. And when Microsoft transferred the whole operation to Texas, Kwame got employed. So congratulations on creating jobs, Mr. Cyber. You and Max Patrol, you and Colbison, you and Lear, you're doing a wonderful job to undermine the economy of the country I love and the city I have paid dues in for 20 years to look at your disgusting smirk on your face. And I've addressed issues that could pay for some of the things we have to beg and raise millage for. You'd rather give it to CBS. I'm not listening. I'm speaking. Mr. You're the Governor, one that's not Mr. listening. Governor. Thank you for your time. I love the city. For Ms. Lawrence. The next uh, request for recognition from Ms. Jeremy Amato. Ms. Simon Amato. Thank you. Um, I want to pick up where I cut off last time, but I had something I wanted to speak about in particular. I've been staying at a condominium for the first time in my life, a complex. It's a smaller scale one, I understand, here in Southfield. They have a trio of board members, and this season they have 
President Geneva Foskey, Vice President Andrea Whitfield, and Treasurer Secretary Wayne Fuller. And then there is a legal firm out of um, St. Clair Shores named uh, Wayne Wegner and Associates, and Jeffrey Bulmer is in the front lines. Well, I, I filed a complaint against Jeffrey Bulmer with the association that supposedly handles grievances against attorneys. But my experience elsewhere that here is that such organizations that claim they are disciplining or holding attorneys to a professional code do not do so on behalf of citizens who are wronged. They only do so when they want to check someone that's getting out of line with the establishment's agenda. In another state, I had two attorneys threatened because they dared to assert the rights of their client. These are the, another Bar Association operative um, jurisdiction or his territory or, you know, or one at bar or at bench, either way. I am going to leave, just I have, to have a couple extra papers here, I'm just going to leave in case anybody wanted to review these things. But I, I'm a visitor at this condominium, and I've been harassed and hindered for the entire time I've been here through verbose um, uh, communications from an attorney, when it's, the communication need not go to an attorney at all. And then reportedly during this administration's um, tenure, the <coughs> association's reserves have been depleted to a larger extent than usual. And there was a financial audit done. And even though the members at large requested a copy of it, the members at large did not get it. Only selected members got it. And this attorney apparently is using every opportunity to advance his bottom line, writing letters, uh, emails, phone calls. He's loving every minute of it, and, and he's banking on it. He even brought one of the co-owners, they call him, to, into litigation for something that should have been resolved internally amongst the co-members there, the so-called co-owners, although no one owns anything in this nation today. But They've been running this thing, they have a thing going on. This particular group, they tell me uh, some of the testimonies, they tell, tell me it hasn't always been like this. But this particular group, this trio of board members and this particular attorney out of Wayne Wagner's firm have a thing going on. And I filed a complaint here and there. So far, nothing has been investigated. I'm told by that organization down in Detroit that this person has not violated any code of professional conduct. And apparently this attorney knows that, that he's not going to be held accountable. And this board has been getting away with it for a while, I guess, because they're all proceeding very brazenly. And instead of trying to create some harmony amongst co-owners, they're doing their damnedest to create friction and conflict. He raked, uh, this attorney also uh, racked up like $4,000 in uh, fees taking a woman to court about a dog that was oversized for regulations. I thought he was trying to get my family into litigation because I was a visitor with my service dogs. They've been harassing me ever since. I've been there, as I said. They want me to prove I'm disabled because I don't look like it, they tell me, and prove I need two service dogs, like with any of their business. I wasn't creating any disruption there, and I have a couple letters to show uh, the type of work that's being done. And I don't know if this is an aberration in Southfield or if these type of scams are being perpetrated across the board with condominiums and homeowners associations. I understand that many people are disillusioned with the workings of some of those, but as I was told, it depends on the season, who you have as board members. Uh, if you have decent people in there that are uh, kind and honest, you don't have all the friction. But when you have a group in there that wants to run it like an authoritarian regime and penalize people for every little infraction. Mr. Mato, your time is up. It is. Well, thank you. I was going to try to pick up on my uh, theme from the last time rather than this particular I, one. But I thank you for not at least cutting me off abruptly as you did last time. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Next request is from Mr. Gerard Mullen.
Madam President, my name is Gerard Mullen. Since 1968, I have lived at 17880 Louis Street. Tonight, I'm here to talk about a great tragedy that has fallen upon this great city. Unfortunately, our library will be reducing its hours by 33 and a third percent. That is, by 22 hours per week starting September the 4th. This wonderful Southfield treasure that cost us $37 million and attracts 2,000 patrons daily will be closed each and every Friday henceforth. The doors will be locked. The lights will be turned off. The computers will lie idle and Mark Twain will be sitting in the dark, alone with no one, but no one to share his wit with. How sad, how truly sad, how sad indeed. This evening I would like to offer an alternative to the reduction of the library's hours by 33 and a third percent, and thus restore the library's hours back to normal with a cost-saving program, a 12-step program that I call Shared Sacrifice. Step one, reduce council salary by 33 and a third percent. That's you folks. Step two, reduce the mayor's salary by 33 and a third percent. Step three, reduce the city clerk's salary by 33 and a third percent. Step four, reduce the city treasurer's salary by 33 and a third percent. Step five, reduce the salary of all city employees who make over $100,000 a year by 33 and a third percent. Step six, reduce the free trips by 33 and a third percent. If you folks want to network throughout this planet, use the internet and set up Northwest Airlines. It's a lot cheaper, it's a whole lot faster, and to top it off, you folks won't get a sunburn. Step seven, reduce council's consumption of free food by 33 and a third percent. Why can't you folks from bag like Warren Buffett and Sam Walton? Step eight, reduce the number of tax abatements by 33 and a third percent. Why does council continue to this very day to subsidize Denzel's half billion dollar criminal fine to Uncle Sam via a tax abatement scam at the expense of the Southfield Library? Let Denzel pay for its own traffic ticket. After all, Denzel ran the red light, not the library. Step nine, reduce the number of paid lobbyists in Lansing by 33 and a third percent. I thought we sent Ruby Hobbs and Vincent Gregory off the Lansing to lobby for Southfield, and it doesn't cost this city a penny. Step 10, reduce the free cars by 33 and a third percent. Step 11, reduce the free gas by 33 and a third percent. Step 12, reduce the free auto insurance by 33 and a third percent. When Oprah gave out free cars, she didn't give out free gas and free insurance. This city is trying to out Oprah, Oprah. There's one big difference between Oprah and this city. Oprah has over $2 billion in the bank, while this city is kissing bankruptcy. That's why last year, Southland had to be bailed out by the taxpayers in order to keep this city afloat. It was the bailout to help the library as marketed, or was the bailout really for free cars, free gas, free insurance, the lobbyists, those criminals at Denzel, free food, free trips, and to maintain the fat cat, fat salaries? Tonight, I would like to suggest to council that you write this ship with a rule 10. Otherwise, we the voters will do a rule 10 on you. It's time for a change. Yes, it's time for a change. In a word, cut the fat and give the surplus to the library. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you.
Mr. Tully Rhodes. Tully Rhodes, 17001 New Jersey, Southfield, Michigan, 48075. I want to talk about my interaction with the Southfield Police, the Southfield City Attorney, and 46th District Court with regards to Bank of America. Last time I spoke at the Southfield, at this kind of meeting, I walked out and was arrested by the Southfield Police. Now, I know they did it because I've been speaking out against them about their violence, their brutality, their crimes against the public. And they used that as an opportunity, I guess, to send a message to me that they won't tolerate any dissent. I can see why very few others in the community want to speak out against them because the Southfield Police are basically immune from prosecution. The City Attorney will not prosecute any crimes against the Southfield Police, no matter what it is, up to and including murder. That's the nature of the Southfield Police and the Southfield City Attorney's Office. I consider the Southfield Police, they're just policing in general, an excuse to make violence against the public. They're not here for public safety. A lot of people believe that. They believe that lie that the police are here to keep you safe. They're not. The police have absolutely no concern for the safety of the public. What they're concerned about mostly is maintaining the status quo, making sure that the rich stay rich and the poor stay poor. And they're lying in between to make sure you stay in your place, to make sure you're subjugated, to make sure you're controlled, to make sure you don't make trouble for those who are controlling and owning what's going on in your community. There was a famous case in Washington, D.C., to give you an idea of how much commitment the police have to your safety, where a woman was being raped and her three roommates were upstairs. They kept calling the police and they kept saying they're on their way, they're on their way, they're on their way. And after a half hour, they didn't hear anything downstairs. So they went downstairs to see what was going on. And to their surprise, the attackers hadn't left. They were still there. So for the next 14 hours, they were all raped, robbed, and beaten. Now, fortunately, they survived the ordeal. And they filed a lawsuit against the local police for failure to protect. And the very famous decision, the Court of Appeals ruled that they threw out the case and said that the police in this country, the United States, have absolutely no duty, no obligation, no responsibility whatsoever to protect you. None. They can see a crime being committed against you. They can see you victimized and brutalized. It's not their responsibility to do anything. Or at least you cannot hold them responsible for their failure to protect. Another federal court judge made the point that the police are not your personal bodyguard. In fact, the point has been made by some defense attorneys that the number one person responsible for your personal safety is you. Don't let the phone be your first line of defense. If you're relying on, first, getting to the phone, second, someone answering, third, someone having time to actually speak to them, then fourth, that the police actually come and defend, they actually do what you want, you're actually taking your personal safety very, very lightly. So the police aren't here to keep anyone safe. They're here to make sure you stay in line. They show that to me repeatedly over the past three years. I mean, this has been my personal experience with the Southfield Police. I have the legal and lawful right to pick it. It's been established by the Supreme Court and the Michigan Constitution and the Michigan Supreme Court. But they don't care because Bank of America is the owner of Southfield. The Southfield Police have determined that. They're the ones who control this community or the other corporations who they deem worthy of protection. Those are the ones who control the community. The homeowners, the taxpayers, the voters, those who live here, you're here to stay in your place, to do as you're told. And if you try to say anything against them, they will attack you. They will accuse you. It doesn't matter if there's evidence. It doesn't matter if there's facts. Once accused, and you go into 46th District Court, the city attorney will make sure that the judge sees you as guilty. And if you get the wrong judge, you can forget it. Because in my case, I went before William J. Bridges. I've been charged repeatedly by the Southfield Police and succeeded because I always ask for a jury. People from the community. Because if you ask anybody who's paid by the system, the legal system of Southfield, you are guilty the second you are accused. And I was before William J. Richards and accused by the Southfield Police. And he called me a racial slur in open court. Now, I didn't take it too personally because it was against all black men. And the 46th District Court, the Southfield Police, the city attorney's office, make it their business to attack black men because they figure that we're not going to stand up. We're not going to exercise our rights. We're not going to appeal. But it's only because I exercised my rights that I was able to at least have some semblance of appeal. But I have been jailed repeatedly on the false accusations of the Southfield Police. 
In fact, when I see them coming, and my family feels the same way because um, they recognize the, the, all of the crimes the South Hill Police have committed against me, all the violence, all the brutality. I mean, they broke my hand and, and attempted to keep me off the picket line. They hit me in the crotch repeatedly. Mr. Rose, I'm yes. sorry, but you're five minutes to stop. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, through the chair, uh, I can't sit for this one. But, uh, uh, we generally like to wait until everyone has had their chance to make a comment. But when you take on our police department on television, I have to speak up. Okay. I have had an opportunity for over a year to work, many years actually, but especially in the last year, to work very closely with the police department personnel. And let me tell you something. Their quality is outstanding. Their service is outstanding. When you call our dispatch, someone answers. And they answer quickly, and it's three to five minute response time. And when the officers get there, they are properly trained, they are properly <coughs> equipped, they are very professional. And with regard to the event of Mr. Rhodes' um, arrest, that was an outstanding warrant, and the police officer was doing the duty. Uh, their duty under that warrant. Uh, I'd like to point out also that we have one of the most outstanding records in the state of Michigan for uh, our um, respect for the public uh, through the police department and that one of the measures there is, is complaints and essentially we get we get very very few, and when they're investigated, frankly, uh, most of them don't make a whole lot of sense. They're worthy there because there are other issues involved, and uh, our litigation against the city, uh, the police department, is uh, has one of the best records in the state of Michigan or in the region. So when someone takes on our police department. Uh, I feel I have to speak up. I apologize for the interruption and the flow, but uh, I can't <coughs> stand with this. Mr. Rhodes has a good command of the English language. Uh, I commend him for that. Unfortunately, the uh, use uh, of his intellectual capacity doesn't appear to be uh, in a positive direction. And I would just say that when you take on our police department, you better know what you're talking about because their excellence has been verified by, by sources uh, that are credible and um, they are outstanding in their, in their respect to the public and the duties that, that they attend to. Thank you very much. My name is Ms. Pamela Gerald. I am an independent voice for Southfield. Regardless of the obstacles thrown my way, the attempts to create a paper trail the false accusations and the reported suspicious circumstances, I am even more determined and will continue to be the independent voice for Southfield. If you are watching this meeting on Cable 15 or listening to my voice via YouTube or audio reproduction, I can be reached at P.O. Box 155, Southfield, Michigan, 48037-0155, or my telephone number is 248 352-9188. I will never lose my joy or my passion to help you, the people, even while under attack. As your independent voice, that is my commitment to you. Whenever you hear a siren, someone in public safety is risking their lives for you, one of your neighbors, someone you know, or someone else in the city. How are we as a city treating our police officers? Are we serious about public safety here in Southfield? This city should be engaging in fair contract talks. Instead, this city is trying to force our police department to take deep concessions. Have the people seen any concessions from council or the executive administration? What have you guys given up lately? Question. What does this, why does this council have such a slow response time when it comes to selecting a permanent police chief, one who is educated, qualified, can improve morale, and that's respected by his peers? 
Question, why does this council have such a slow response time when it comes to hiring the desperately needed 30 police officers, including the two cadets that are already trained? Our cadets should not be police and waiting after three years when we need more police officers on the street now. Mr. Charette, respectfully, tell the people exactly how many police officers are we down in the city of Southfield? We need, we need more police officers to secure our borders instead of trying to use the police to harass me in the front of parks and recreation while passing out literature urging people to vote in the primary. Question, has the police department benefited from the public safety village? Tell the people if that money can be used to hire the 30 police officers we must have in the community. Our people realize that a community is only as strong as its public safety. Council, do you know that? Question, why does this council have such a slow response time when it comes to giving our police officers an acceptable contract? Since 2008, there has been no contract, and that is unacceptable. If their service is outstanding, Mr. Charette, give them a contract and stop dragging your feet. Remember, whenever you hear a siren, it is our police officers that are putting their lives on the line for you or someone you love. This alone is worth an acceptable contract. It's time for a change. The most important issue right now in Southfield is public safety. Council, it is the police that respond within three to five minutes, not you. Council, it is the police that risk their lives for us when they get the radio call, not you. Council, they deserve a pay increase, not you. If you continue at this rate, you are jeopardizing the people's public safety because you are crushing the morale within the police department. Our police officers should not have to fight the administration and the bad guys on the streets at the same time. Tell me and the people what's more important. Is it fracking resolutions, free cars, free gas, free trips, free food, or public safety? It's time for a change, Council. It's public safety time. Give our police officers a contract now.
the library board, after staff review, decided to close the library on Friday uh, because it is, its expenditures are exceeding its revenue from its dedicated millage. And the reason they chose Friday is because it is the day that the library has the fewest patrons. It has, um, just doesn't have the, it's staffed, but it has fewer people than any other time during the week. And so it was a, um, a, a budget restructuring move that was made and to impact the, uh, the customers of the library the least. So thank you for bringing that up, but I'm glad to clarify uh, how that decision was made. Yes, uh, I'd like to answer Jerome more. It cost me money to be a public official. Okay? I get no payments for cars, nothing. I get a subscription to a magazine. That's my only perks. I pay my own insurance. So, I'm a good volunteer for the past 30 years. I have returned the alleged $5,000 we get for travel. I returned it to the city for the last six years. That's $30,000 back to the city. So, we want 33 and third for me, for my, what I don't get. Hmm? Okay. I work 24-7. I get phone calls Saturday, Sunday, Friday, 12 o'clock at night, 6 o'clock. The desperate people. And I help them. So, and I imagine the rest of them, too, work very hard. And to the amount of the mad pittance they get is nothing, practically nothing. It costs every one of them to be a public official. So what are you talking about? You don't know. It's, it's difficult to answer a lot of the questions. Uh, if Pam Darrell would only know the truth about the the contracts and the police and the labor and everything, we're not hurting the police. It's all labor negotiations, it's all process. We're not doing it. And you know what labor is. It's it's hard to answer. It's hard to you should know. You you do research and everything there is. You should know the truth, but you don't know the truth. Well, I better stop. It's a waste of time. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lance. Uh, next, we come to the council portion. Uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Frazier. Uh, we have two sets of uh, expense reimbursements for uh, Mr. Fricassi. I'd like to take them one at a time. Uh, I move that we approve the Expenses for Mr. Fricassi for attending the SEMCAP General Assembly. Motion by Mr. Frazier. Support. Supported by Mr. Moss. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion to Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Fricassi. Please let the record show that Mr. Fricassi has the same. And I, uh, uh, I move that we approve the uh, expenses of Mr. Fricassi for the induction ceremonies at the uh, uh, Michigan Sports Hall of Fame. Support. Um, motion by Mr. Uh, Frazier, support by Mr. Moss. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And motion by Mr. Yes, Ms. Uh, Banks is uh, voted Mr. Sakaki at this point. Next we come to the Yes. Something under count. Yes. I, uh, on a positive note, I'd like to uh, mention that in the last two months, a number of local businesses um, have had open houses and um, have invited council and the mayor um, and the clerk uh, 
Ten, um, and uh, I would mention uh, Secure 24 uh, in the First Center office complex uh, on Northwestern Highway uh, uh, west of Washer. Um, what an outstanding um, investment in what was vacant space uh, in this. Uh, they, they renovated two floors of the uh, First Center office complex. And um, is, this is an IT firm that uh, does cloud uh, computing. Um, it's um, honestly how they do it and what they all, it, it's really beyond me, but uh, it's a tremendous, uh, when I went through the facility, uh, the investment um, not only in um, uh, upgrading office space, but in the equipment um, in this office is tremendous. Um, an another another one, um, uh, Blue Water Technologies, um, has totally redone its, its uh, headquarters on Northwestern uh, uh, Highway at uh, <coughs> Mount Vernon. Uh, once again, this is a, a video technology firm, um, and it's just amazing. You go through there and um, see. The, the beautiful space, but also the uh, amount of technology. Uh, we were also invited to Open Town Square, um, a building that was built uh, roughly uh, 12 years ago, um, one of our last high-rises, and um, it's had a major uh, rehab, um, uh, new amenities for, uh, for tents, and uh, will be op uh, has opened a new restaurant at the former uh, Morton's space uh, called Gastronomy, um, uh, and Gastronomy now has a liquor license, or was, shortly will, um, another major investment. And finally, 1-800-LAW-FIRM um, uh, on the corner of Northwestern Highway in Washer. Um, here was a building long vacant um, in uh, rather poor condition, has had a tremendous remake um, uh, with, um, once again, um, a major investment, but uh, creating um, great working space for uh, its employees as well as uh, its tenants. Um, I uh, like to accept these invitations because I like to see how our business is doing in our community. And uh, here are just four that uh, have made uh, a significant um, investment in, um, in Southfield. So I'm pleased to share that um, with uh, everyone tonight. Thank you, Mr. Simon. Thank you, Mr. Perkowski. Yes, I would like to just state that uh, one of the expense reports that I have was a, um, seeing one of Southfield's finest uh, young men inducted into the Michigan Hall of Fame uh, the young man grew up in the um, uh, north uh, east side of Southfield, went to Southfield High School. Um, actually, he was born in Highland Park, came here at a very young age. We had a ball field at Southfield High named after him. His name is Ted Simmons. He is still in baseball. He is assistant to general manager of a team. And, um, of course, he caught for the St. Louis Cardinals, the uh, Milwaukee uh, Milwaukee, so Brewers. So it was just a very nice uh, induction and event, and uh, 19 of his classmates uh, showed up unannounced, and, uh, and it was just really great because uh, he probably had the biggest fan club there, that group. So uh, again, the Southfield young man did very well. Thank you. Been uh, cybernetic on the same wavelength in terms of supporting uh, or mentioning a few grand openings that have happened recently here in the city. And the first one I'd like to mention is the Creed's Hair Salon, which is located at 19011 10 Mile, owned by Donna and Craig Kelser. And, and Greg Kelser is actually a former uh, MSU basketball player as well as a former Detroit. Piston player and currently works as a sports uh, caster with uh, ESPN. And they've opened up state of the heart 
here's the line, and just please, council and the public, go by and visit, because it's just second to none. It's absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, yesterday, my husband and I had an opportunity to visit a new restaurant in Southfield, Billy Sims Barbecue, which is 10 miles of grass, and they've done a fantastic job uh, just renovating the closed Arby restaurant. They did a beautiful landscape, beautiful building, and we're proud to have them in the city of Southfield. And then lastly, there's an event coming up I'd like to invite all of the viewing audience to. And it's a premier fashion show that will be held here in the city of Southfield and is sponsored by Michigan Fashion Week. That's going to take place on Saturday, September the 15th, here at the Southfield City Center. It's going to be hosted by Bianca Golden, which is one of America, she's a finalist in America's Top Model. So visit www.michigan Fashion Week and let's support the great things that are happening here in the city of Southfield. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Yeah, I have a few things. Um, I've got a few community events uh, over the last two weeks, and I think the number one thing as I was meeting with residents uh, that they were uh, talking to me about, and I completely share in their frustration, is the amount of construction in the city of Southfield. I think there's a, we all understand the logic, you know, it's that the end product is going to be a lot better than what we're going through now or what we've had in the past, but, uh, you know, obviously, you know, it's, it, we have where some of us are trying to find alternate routes um, to, to kind of bypass, especially that Lasser Road uh, construction, which is a lane widening construction. But I was actually out in the community off of Bell Road in the neighborhoods there, and I just wanted to let the residents um, just be vigilant as you're seeking alternate routes. Just be aware that there's still a reduced speed limit on roads like Bell Road, um, and there's actually a, a still a stop sign on Bell Road at uh, Coventry. Uh, Coventry Woods uh, Road, and it, it's a kind of an awkward intersection, but it's, it, that's becoming kind of more of a major road in the temporary construction that we're experiencing now. It's still a residential area. There are no sidewalks there, so people have to walk on the side of the road when they when they walk uh, down that corridor. So just be vigilant as you're taking alternate routes in the city of Southfield to be aware that they're in the middle of a neighborhood. You got to uh, abide by the, the speed limit there. And while we're on the subject of roads and all the construction, I just wanted to make uh, the residents know about an event coming up this Thursday, which is being hosted by our state representative, Rudy Hobbs, the Michigan Department of Transportation, the Oakland County Road Commission, and Students Reinventing Michigan. It's going to be a town hall meeting on transportation that's going to be held here at our Southfield Library. It's basically to answer questions, address concerns, and give up-to-date information on what the state is doing to improve the infrastructure. And in specific, some of the topics are the misconceptions about roads and road funding from the state, how Michigan is different from other states on transportation issues, and this transportation legislative package and what it means specifically to Southeast Michigan. So again, that, and there's going to be a question and answer portion too, so you can get a lot of answers. Um, I think the city you know, officials should come to it too um, to kind of get a better understanding of what's going on with the state and how it's affecting our road funding. Again, that's Thursday, August 30th at the Southfield Library from 6 to 8 p.m. A lot of good things going on in spite of the economy. We've got some really good news to talk about. That's great. Um, there's nothing else. We'll move on to the mayor's portion. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's always a balance when you are um, running a business or a community. There are the things that we do extremely well. There are things that give us hope. Um, there's things that um, Sometimes you build a hand like with the economy, and it's not something that you jump up and down and say it's the best performance ever, but you feel so so much pride that we survived it. Uh, the city of Southville is truly a survivor. The city of Southville has so many examples of hope, and I'm going to go through a few of those. And we embrace uh, continuously. Uh, the opportunity to get it right. And as citizens, I, I welcome um, anytime you have concerns or issues. Um, but also, um, and I'm glad there were positive things here because we need to, these televised meetings to have a balance of oh, this amazing city that we as elected officials serve and the people 
just fabulous people in the city, that we do have a great city and continue to do it. Uh, we can't stick our heads in the sand and say we're perfect because we're not, but I can tell you we can stand proud to say that we have an amazing uh, sense of hope in this community. I just want to talk about a few of those. Um, I'm just going to call it Summer in Southfield, the, the Bird Conference. I've just an amazing three concerts that are mostly our seniors, but I don't know if I'm getting older, but it seems like the age range has expanded because there's tremendous music there. And attending that uh, at the opening concert and the closing and in Senior Day that just happened um, in the last week, where we actually gave tribute to our seniors and, and uh, just let them know that the money that they pay and have paid over the years in the city that we respect, honor them, and um, make sure that the tax dollars they know that they pay are also services and programs for them to park and rent. Our pool, we had our clothing day in our pool, and it's been refurbished, and we have the, the weather to support a fabulous pool. And so I'm, I'm, uh, we had a good year for our city pool, and we were proud that we actually invested in it and started looking cleaner and, and more inviting. The Little League teams, um, every year I get to throw out uh, the pitch down for Kathy and uh, Myron and, and John, some of the other council people come out and, and Mr. Moss, where it's kind of like the kickoff of the summer. And uh, I was there for the opening day of the Miracle League and Councilman Moss and I were there for the closing of the summer league at the Miracle League. And to see the young people, you have the disabled children, or the, I'm sorry, not disabled, the, the children with some physical challenges. And you also have um, our young people playing ball and learning the, the lessons of sports in, in this community. I also attended um, this, this last weekend before last. Uh, the South Hill um, Open House, that they called it, where they invited parents to come out and meet the principals. And it, at South Hill High, there was a line all the way to Tim Monroe, a parent, lined up with their kids to come um, to meet the new principal in the, in, of the school to get information. They were giving out free books. There was just this celebration that school was starting again at South Hill High, and it was just an amazing uh, sight to see because um, our schools are totally tied to our image, and I, I use all of my political power to show that we are a partner and I want them to be successful. And anything that I can do, and many of you have done, to make our schools better, um, to support them, uh, they need it. But something I attended that I thought was just amazing this summer, it was the South Hill High All Class Reunion. And it was right here on the ground, it was just a, it was packed. It was packed with all of these adults that have gone through South Hill High. They get together every year, they play ball, and they cook, and they um, revisit.
It may sound like uh, okay, the mayor is really going to have to deal with that. But I really, really um, just want the community to know that with all of our towns, which is going to be so many communities, some wealthy enough, some with less resources, and they can look at thousands and say, wow, that's a city that city is not. They find a way to get it right. And even with the disagreement on council, I have my own disagreement with things. But we find a way to get it done at the end of the day, take care of the city and the community. And to my fighters and police, uh, south of the finest, I ship my national council. I'm proud of them. They are human beings. Uh, but at the end of the day, when I call that home, I have told them that professional, trained, public service to show them my door and take care of me. And uh, I too look forward <laughs> and have questions the uh, length of time for our chief. Uh, and I want, I want my chief appointed and in the seat to take care of the city. And we have been updated the process to make sure we get the best and the highest um, but we do need our chief in place. And it speaks to our police and fire that even during this process, I had not heard any complaints about them dropping the ball. They had been tremendous. The last thing I'm going to 